Ok, donc, est-ce que, est-ce que vous nous tout le monde et merci mm-hmm. d'être venu au séminaire de RQMP. Est-ce que vous nous entendez? Ça m'a fait plaisir de vous de présenter un conférencier qui est en fait l'invité d'André-Marie Tremblay. André-Marie donne un cours en ce moment, donc il ne peut pas être ici, donc c'est moi qui va faire la présentation. Bon, la présentation n'est pas très longue et les conférenciers n'aiment pas de longues présentations. Donc, <rire> donc euh, et il s'appelle Frédéric Krin et il a fait son doctorat à l'Université de Hambourg sous la supervision d'Alexandre Liechtenstein sur le sujet des électrons fortement corrélés. Et puis, actuellement, il est postdoc à l'Université technique de Vienne où il travaille avec Hag. Uh, Carsten Held, yes. Carsten Held, uh, dans les sujets aussi des de électrons fortement corrélés. Aujourd'hui, il, il va nous parler sur uh, uh, la diffusion uh, des paramagnons uh, de pseudo-gap ou faible couplage ou fort couplage. Okay. Merci. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Let me apologize first that I don't speak any French. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, Yeah, and uh, thanks very much to uh, André-Marie Tremblay for the kind invitation here to give this seminar. So we'll talk about paramagnon scattering and pseudo gaps um, from weak to strong coupling. Um, And we look uh, from a general perspective on a phenomenon where a spectral gap in a fermionic spectrum is opened by um, bosons with a small mass. So uh, you would have a a boson which can be parameterized by Um, by a certain characteristic wave vector and the mass, this mass is supposed to become smaller. And then this starts to develop a big peak. And this peak can have a feedback on the uh, fermionic spectrum. So um, for example, here, there's a case which was recently investigated a lot, which is the, um, uh, the Hubbard model on the square lattice at weak coupling. So this um, the non-interacting density of states has a von Hove singularity. That's the upper, the upper picture here. And um, the red curve would roughly correspond to the um, non-interacting system or uh, yeah, in the DMFT approximation, but, but here DMFT doesn't really do anything because the interaction is small. So basically you have a peak at the Fermi level. And then because uh, spin fluctuations are very strong in this system, so because this is a nested system with a nested Fermi surface, um, Uh, these bosons have a huge feedback on the fermionic spectrum and will eventually create a pseudo gap at low temperature. So there's a suppression of the electronic density of states at the Fermi level. Um, this picture here is from a publication which uh, calculated these uh, spin fluctuations from the beta zeta equation. And this can be truncated at s- certain orders with corresponding to longer and longer distances. And you see then the more orders of the beta zeta equation are taken into account the bigger the pseudo gap becomes, which which shows that this is really a a phenomenon of long range spin fluctuations, which eventually create this gap. So this happens typically near second order phase transitions where one feels the the feedback of the ordered phase, but it's not yet real order. There's simply a long correlation length. Um, uh, In the considered example of spin fluctuations or paramagnons, this um, mass corresponds to the inverse correlation length. So the idea is that the correlation length becomes very large, and then eventually the spin fluctuations create this gap in the spectral functions. But this is the case of weak coupling, and the pseudo gap is also found at strong coupling. This is the case of the doped Hubbard model at strong coupling. And there, similarly, you see that the pseudo gap is formed near the Fermi level. And also this is supposed to be the uh, caused by spin fluctuations. And I like to co- uh, talk about the difference between these two paradigmatic cases, the Hubbard model at weak coupling and the Hubbard model at strong coupling in their application to coup rates. Um, as I said, so these are solutions to the Hubbard model. So the, the top uh, case is one where the interaction is rather small and this particle holds a metric. It was done by Panone et al. And this has a perfectly nested Fermi surface. And the second case is one that's strong coupling, the doped case, um, where uh, even though there's no next nearest neighbor hopping, the Fermi surface is quite curved. Um, 
And I will tell you that these pseudo gaps are both the result of antiferromagnetic fluctuations, but nevertheless, they differ qualitatively. And I will peel out two uh, main differences between them here. Um, so first of all, let's uh, roughly define what we mean by pseudo gap. So what we mean is a momentum selective suppression of the electronic spectral weight. Um, and for this, we will consider, for example, a Matsubara uh, safe energy. And um, we can roughly determine um, where a pseudo gap opens by a simple criterion. So um, when the slope of the self energy and uh, the smallest Matsubaras is positive, um, we will have a very large scattering rate and a suppressed spectral weight at the, at the Fermi level. And then we will be in the pseudo gap regime. Whereas um, uh, when the slope is negative, um, we are in a more metallic regime. So actually this solution here on the bottom, again, corresponds to this case of the square lattice. And there you see, um, this, this is the, the difference of the self energy plotted at the first and the second Matsubaras. And you see that you have a nodal antinodal dichotomy in this coil. So the node is the point here at pi half, pi half. And the antinode is the, now the point at pi zero and zero pi. And you see that they have already very strong scattering in, the, in these antinodal directions, um, which satisfy the pseudo gap criterion, while the node is still metallic. So this is the, how the gap opens in this square lattice Hubbard model. It opens first in the antinode point, and then this gap eventually at low temperatures when the correlation length becomes very large, it, uh, it opens the gap on the, on the entire Fermi surface. So this is the criterion that we will use. So it's simply the slope of the Matsubara self energy. It's not perfect, but it works reasonably well. Um, one could also consider a strong condition for a pseudo gap or for gap formation, which is the non-existence of solutions of the part quasi particle um, uh, equation. But uh, this intrinsically requires analytical continuation and makes the problem much harder. So we will not consider this here. We will stay with this simple criterion that can be checked on um, imaginary frequencies. Um, and we will consider a case, the single band Hubbard model with a curved Fermi surface. So the non-interacting dispersion has a shape like this with the um, nearest neighbor hopping and the next nearest neighbor hopping. And we will tune this model to a place where so-called hotspots exist. So this is the Brion zone on the right. And the Fermi surface is the this black curved lines here. And they intersect with the so-called antiferromagnetic Brion zone. Um, so the idea is again, that we are close to this antiferromagnetic phase transition. And these intersection points are called hotspots. Yeah, so we will tune the Fermi surface, so we will tune the filling of the system to a place where these hotspots exist. Okay. Um, so uh, a simple way to approach this problem in a weak coupling setting is to make um, a GD, uh, an ansatz of the GW form. So uh, uh, the idea is that we have an expression for the self energy given in terms of the uh, spin fluctuation, which is called W here, this uh, screened interaction corresponding to the spin fluctuation. And the idea is to take this feedback on the fermionic spectrum into account. So diagrammatically, uh, this would be simply a one loop diagram for the self energy. And then we parameterize this boson in terms of a characteristic uh, momentum and in terms of um, a correlation length C. Yeah? And you can already see when this C becomes very long, very large, then the, uh, we can focus on the static um, component of the spin fluctuation. Let's call it a classical regime. And then we don't need to take into account quantum corrections from the finite frequencies. Yeah? Because you see for any finite Matsubara frequency, this expression cut off, but for omega equals zero, when the correlation length is long, there is no cutoff and you will have a very large peak at the characteristic momentum. So um, what is the effect of this peak? So, um, uh, you can think of fermions sitting on the Fermi surface and then being scattered by this um, transferred momentum, large Q. And there are certain available target states, which are simply given by the, uh, by the Fermi surface and 
in combination with the scattering vector. So these, uh, uh, these areas here enclosed by the circuits are the available target states for um, fermionic scattering from these um, power magnons. Um, and uh, they are simply somewhere in the Brion zone. Yeah? And the width of these circuits corresponds to the correlation length. So for very large correlation length, this width of the circle will be very small. And for short correlation length, you will have a big circle corresponding to a very broad peak. So but now when we're interested, as I said, in the uh, imaginary part of the self energy, and in particular then in the limit of uh, small frequency, when we go to the Fermi level, we see taking the imaginary part that this expression is given by the uh, imaginary part of the Green's function, which is simply the spectral weight at the target point. So this means that the uh, spectral weight here introduces a further constraint on the fermionic scattering, which means that actual scatterings which enhance the scattering rate can only happen close to the so-called hotspots. Yeah? So you see only here for the hotspots, there is sufficiently much uh, spectral weight at the target. So this scattering can occur. Oops. Whereas for different points on the Fermi surface, this would not be the case. Yeah? Somewhere here near the node, uh, you would simply not have any available target states. Um, so this is called the nesting condition. And uh, because of this, the largest scattering rate is, is, uh, uh, is expected to occur um, uh, near the hotspots. Yeah? So the intersection of the Fermi surface with the antifermionic prion zone. This is the weak coupling picture of how a solo gap can form in such a, for in such a curved uh, Fermi surface. Um, there is a, so a criterion for the correlation length. Um, which was uh, found by Wilk and Tremblay. And um, so the criterion is that when the correlation length exceeds the so-called thermal de Broglie wavelength, um, then a pseudo gap will open. So the gap will open at the hotspots. Yeah? So this means you need a long correlation length. You need to aim very precisely. And this means the gap will open uh, precisely at the hotspots. Um, if you consider a case of small correlation length, it's quite different um, because uh, first of all, you have to draw these large circles and you will have many more target states. It's much easier to hit the Fermi surface in these scatterings, but also these uh, finite frequencies of the, um, uh, of the susceptibility of the, of the power magnon dispersion will still uh, contribute. And this means we're not in the classical regime anymore. So the, the problem changes quite a bit, but I will explain that in all of the pseudo gaps we look at here, we are in a classical regime. So these finite frequencies can be neglected, but for different reasons at weak and at strong coupling. So you see that uh, also there is not a big difference here, a dip big differentiation, for example, between a, a hotspot here, this intersection point and the antinodal point at the edge of the Brion zone, because simply because the correlation length is so short, um, there's not much differentiation of the Fermi surface. There will be sim simply in the antinodal area here around CI, um, there, uh, there will simply be a enhanced scattering on each point on the Fermi surface, but the gap doesn't open. So this is the weak coupling picture. And uh, this was actually uh, found in the experiment, and in particular in uh, the electron doped coup rates. So um, uh, in these compounds, you will find a very long correlation length. So here, even on the order of 80 lattice sites. And indeed in the fermionic spectrum, so this is an ARPA spectrum, you will find that um, at the intersection of the Fermi surface with the antifermionic rion zone, um, indeed the spectrum will be suppressed. Okay, so this is precisely this hotspot scattering that I explained before, which can be explained um, through the weak coupling mechanism. And um, Andre Marie has put forth a method very early in the 90s, I think already, with together with Wilk, the two particles have consistent approach, which describes this phenomenon very well. So I would say that uh, the pseudo gap here in this, in this setting is more or less understood. But a much more controversial picture is for the hold of coup rates. Actually, here you find a different pseudo gap. So these are again ARPA spectra for, um, under, for an underdoped coup rate. And the uh, spectral function actually, instead of having a pseudo gap opened at a hotspot, it rather appears that the Fermi surface is truncated 
at the antiferromagnetic prion zone. Yeah, so this is a, a qualitative difference. And also one finds a very short correlation length. So on the order of rather one to two lattice spacings. Yeah, so instead of a pseudo gap open, opening in a point, it opens here on large parts of this Fermi surface. And instead of a long correlation length, it's a very short one, one to two lattice spacings, okay? So these are two qualitative differences. And what I like to do now in the following is to try to explain in a similar way in the spin fluctuation theory, how the shape of this Fermi surface comes about. So this is another experiment before we go into that, um, uh, which also found this uh, truncation of the of Fermi arcs at the antiferromagnetic prion zone. And there are further papers and experiments which all find us that this is a very sharp um, truncation line. So actually from a numerical viewpoint, um, there's a consensus basically that this uh, pseudo gap uh, um, phenomenology that I explained for the whole dope case is indeed captured by the um, Hubbard model at rather strong coupling. So here are cases, for example, uh, cluster perturbation theory on the left, um, and, uh, and diagrammatic Monte Carlo, which show um, uh, um, uh, um, Fermi surfaces, which are indeed, uh, which are indeed uh, consistent with, uh, with the whole of coup rates. We will find, well, this is not, it's not so easily visible here, um, but you, you will find that more or less the spectrum is truncated at this antiferromagnetic prion zone boundary. And in particular, um, uh, here in this DIAC MC result, what they find is that the scattering at the antinodal point, so this edge of the Brion zone, is much enhanced compared to the hotspot. Yeah, oops. Um, and so you see that there's a very large difference here between the hotspot and the antinodal point. And now, but, but imagine that this has a short correlation length, this problem. So how can this be? How can there be such a um, fine differentiation and the, and, the, and the big difference between scattering at the antinodal point and the hotspot when you have a very broad peak um, in the spin fluctuations. Yeah, so this, this is not something that can be easily explained with the weak coupling picture that I explained before. So, but still, um, uh, it is also, I think, now a consensus, there are different methods that agree, for example, the dynamical vertex, uh, um, sorry, the um, dynamical cluster approximation, for example, and the diagrammatic Monte Carlo which agree that this pseudo gap that I showed you before is indeed opened in the Hubbard model by a spin fluctuation. So this is what is called a fluctuation diagnostic from the dynamical cluster approximation. So here um, they show the nodal uh, self energy at pi half pi half, which still is metallic. And um, uh, this is the anti-nodal self energy, which shows a very strong uh, pseudo gap behavior. And what they then do is to, um, to take apart the self energy and show that um, indeed the um, the contribution from the uh, from the spin fluctuations and in particular from the commensurate spin fluctuations at pi pi give the dominant part of the self energy. Yeah. So this is the idea to take so to um, to diagnose uh, the, where the different contributions from the self energy stem from. And indeed, this DCA result shows you can see here that this pi pi spin fluctuations are largely responsible for this gap opening. Okay, so how can this be? We have the short correlation length and we know that the spin fluctuations that open the gap, but still we have such a fine differentiation um, and the difference between uh, a, a qualitative difference to the weak coupling case. Um, and what we argue in our uh, work that is now uh, accepted um, is that um, indeed spin fluctuations open the solo gap and one should indeed be able to have an effective spin fluctuation theory to describe the pseudo gap. But it is not the case that the pseudo gap opens at the hotspot for large correlation length, but at the and but in the but outside of the magnetic prion zone for small correlation length. And the difference between these cases is given by the vertex, so-called vertex correction. So in the weak coupling theory, one simply takes a one loop correction of spin fluctuations um, uh, contributing to the self energy. And what we are saying that this vertex correction here, 
which corresponds to the coupling of fermions to the spin fluctuations, makes a qualitative difference. And this difference is very confusing. So there are now exact results for the Hubbard model and the strong coupling regime. And, about, and even though we have the exact solution of the Hubbard model, still some authors um, don't agree that this can be spin fluctuations. There's, for example, a statement here from one paper I, that I found about the numerically exact results, so about the exact solution where there shouldn't be any open questions, that the calculations here, the peaks in the self energy in the zero pi directions, this is exactly what I said, that the gap opens at the, at the Brion zone boundary, um, at, the, at, the, at the edge of the Brion zone, However, these peaks um, are due to antiferromagnetic correlations. If they are due to antiferromagnetic correlations, one expects other Fermi surface. And with this other Fermi surface, the author, of course, my, uh, uh, means that the gap should open um, at the hotspots. Yeah? So uh, even though we have an exact solution, there's still disagreement um, about the mechanism for the Sulu gap, which makes this problem also so controversial. So our idea is that this vertex correction uh, of course, it depends also on momentum and can change uh, the, uh, the gap formation and momentum. But in particular, it doesn't need to be a real function. And um, uh, uh, what is found is that in, in strongly interacting systems like the Hubbard model, actually this vertex correction develops a large imaginary part also. So uh, we found this in one of our own uh, calculations using DMFT. But here's an example from, uh, uh, from these authors, Huang, and I think Chubukov is also among the authors. They used an eight by eight QMC, and they calculated this vertex correction in different regimes. For example, here in the in a strongly interacting regime, U equal eight. And what they find is that the real part of this vertex is about 0.3 here, and uh, the imaginary part is about 0.2. So this is comparable, yeah? So, and this means that in our model for the spin fluctuations and our spin fluctuation theory for the pseudo gap, we have to take into account a complex uh, scattering vertex. Okay, and this has indeed uh, not been considered before to my knowledge. Um, we find as conditions for this large imaginary part, the strong coupling regime and the large particle hole asymmetry. And these are indeed also um, features that you find in the hold up cuprates. Uh, so now to investigate this effect of the vertex, uh, what we need is a method that has a fairly large spatial resolution and is able to go into the strong coupling regime. And um, so the resolution has to be high enough to differentiate between these different points here, between the nodal point, the antinodal point, and between the hotspot. So we created a diagrammatic method that is able to do that, to differentiate these different points and uh, to calculate this vertex correction, which depends on two momenta and two frequencies. So it's uh, called a dual fermion technique, it's not so important. But uh, we find indeed a picture in the self energy course um, that is consistent with other methods. So what you see here is um, uh, the, um, the self energy at the antinodal point, which indeed shows the insulating behavior. And you see uh, metallic, um, uh, uh, metallic nodal point, yeah, and in, and in particular, look the scattering here at the antinodal point, at the red with the red point in the Brion zone, is much larger than at the hotspot. So once again, this uh, this feature um, that we saw before. So this method that we use is based on the DMFT. So we start from a local self energy and then add non-local corrections, and you see that actually the DMFT solution, this is the the yellow line here, um, lies somewhere in between. And what it appears that, as expected, somewhere in the antinodal directions, there's a big scattering. But also, apparently, some mechanism makes the node more metallic. And this is something that we can also explain with the uh, following investigation, which is that actually spin fluctuations are able to make fermions even more metallic. So not necessarily increase the scattering, but also decrease it. Um, so in our, um, uh, in our method, we can calculate this vertex function. So this is plotted here for different uh, dopings. So the different, uh, so the, the light lines correspond to large dopings and the dark lines correspond to small dopings. And um, what you see is the vertex um, at, the, 
at the nodal point, that's the blue line here. So this, this is so nodal fermions get there from this vertex. And on the right, you see uh, antinodal fermions which get there from here. And this vertex is shown as a function of the um, bosonic momentum. So you should look around the pi pi direction here, the M point. So this, is, uh, this corresponds to the spin fluctuations with the pi pi scattering vector. And indeed, you, we find that the real part, which is drawn on the top, that's about 0.5. And the imaginary part is about 0.2. So we have to somehow take into account this, this complex um, uh, feature of the vertex in our spin fluctuation theory. So the real and imaginary part are of comparable size. So when we now go back into this simple model, so you can now simply go back to the beginning of the talk where I explained about the spin fluctuation theory. When we consider again, the weak coupling case where we simply have a real valued vertex, we saw that there's a nesting condition imposed um, by the form of the spectral density. So the allowed, oops, the allowed target states um, are determined by the spectral density, which is drawn here on the bottom right, which has simply the shape of the Fermi surface. But this is the case for a real valued vertex, which gives you the weak coupling theory. However, when we have a complex vertex, in fact, the, um, the, the paramagnons couple not only to the spectral density given by the imaginary part of the Green's function, but also to the real part of the Green's function, which has a completely different structure. And in particular, it changes sign outside and inside of the Fermi volume. So you can actually have a decrease or an increase of the scattering. And most importantly, this real part of the Green's function is uh, finite uh, basically everywhere in the Brillouin zone, except actually at the, at the Fermi surface itself. But this means that there can be contributions from this kind of scattering processes from all over the Brion zone. So this means that the nesting condition is lifted. Okay, so this imaginary vertex lifts the nesting condition. And when we now concentrate on the effect that this has, so if we concentrate only on the effect of the imaginary part and ignore the real part of the vertex for the moment, we can um, do a scattering theory in a similar fashion as in the beginning of the talk. So when we consider, for example, a nodal fermion here and the nodal point, it can be scattered through this mechanism outside of the Fermi surface into this blue area here. But if we consider an antinodal fermion, it can be scattered into states inside of the Fermi volume. And as I said before, the Green's function, the real part of the Green's function changes sign uh, for these two different cases. So it has different signs. And the sign structure of the vertex and of the Green's function is such that for these scattered fermions outside of the antiferromagnetic Brion zone, we have an enhanced scattering rate. And for the fermions inside of the antiferromagnetic Brion zone, we have a decreased scattering rate. And so you see that actually the pseudo gap that is produced by this scattering effect is simply a geometric feature of the Fermi surface itself. Yeah? So because some parts of it, because we said we have a case where hotspots exist, some parts of the, of the, of the Brion zone, of the, of the Fermi surface, will be outside of the antiferromagnetic Brion zone and other parts inside. And so we have this dichotomy between outside and inside, which is precisely the, exact, uh, the effect found in the experiment. So this is the, the effect found in, in our method. And it's actually, without this effect, you wouldn't have a pseudo gap there of this particular shape. So if we combine this with the effect of the real part of the vertex, um, uh, it, it still plays a role. The weak coupling mechanism is still there, but the actual pseudo gap opens because of the effect that I've explained. Um, and because of this effect that you can have, uh, the, the scattering rate can also be decreased. We see now that going from our starting point, which was the DMFT solution, um, uh, we can actually have also a more metallic nodal point. And this is also found in experiments that actually the nodal points of this Fermi surface are very metallic. Yeah, so actually this non-local spin fluctuations are conducive to these very um, metallic nodal points. So due to this effect that I explained. Um, if there's some problem with the understanding of this picture, we can also go about this in the questions. Yeah? Um, so, and there is another puzzle, which is about the correlation length. 
So we, the pseudo gap at strong coupling opens um, for a short correlation length. And in particular, the shorter, as we find in our method, than the um, thermal de Broglie wavelength. And um, uh, so we also have an explanation from, explanation from this for, for in our method. So we see that the screened interaction, we can describe it uh, in this way here. And we start from a correlated starting point, the DMFT, it's a local theory, and we have a local spin fluctuations in that theory. Okay, so we start from a local spin fluctuation, and then this local spin fluctuation is dressed by a polarization. And since the DMFT solution is directly built into our method, we also have the local moment formation uh, built into the method as well. So DMFT describes a strong coupling, and in particular close to the mod insulating regime, a local moment. And this you can see in this local screened interaction through an enhancement of the uh, zero frequency component of the screened interaction. So the screened interaction at zero frequency will grow and the finite ones do not. So there's simply in the real axis spectrum, a peak uh, building up in the real axis spectrum at low energy. And um, what we argue is that this uh, enhancement of the, of, the static spin, of the static local spin fluctuations actually leads to the, um, to the classical regime, to the, to the, uh, to the peak also in the, uh, the non-local screened interaction. And this can be seen as follows. So if we write the screened interaction in this way, so, so we look at this denominator here, so there's one over the local screened interaction minus the polarization. And we can plot these two quantities. So of course, when they are close, we get the peak in the, in the uh, screened interaction. Yeah? So when we draw the local screened interaction as a function of momentum, of course, it's simply a constant. And this constant here changes and depends a lot on the doping. So the doping level is given here. Yeah? So low dopings, 1% doping will be the yellow line. So somehow when we go to low dopings, we, um, uh, the, the local fluctuations are strongly enhanced. And the polarization behaves in this way. It describes, of course, the formation of uh, an incommensurate peak at large dopings. So these are the blue lines to commensurate peak at low dopings. And at the intersection point of this constant and the, the Q-dependent function, there would be this large peak formation. Yeah? So in here you can see that as we go to low doping, we form um, a commensurate peak. The correlation length increases only slightly. Correlation length corresponds here to the shape of this curve, to the width of the curve. However, at, at the same time, a local moment is formed and this bottom line here goes up. So we have a confluence of um, a commensurate peak formation and, um, uh, and local spin fluctuations um, due to the local moment formation. Yeah? But of course, this is done only at the zero component. So at the finite frequencies, this, this effect does not exist. And this means that this effect will also create a classical regime in the screened interaction. Um, and actually, uh, recent results also from André Marie uh, also show this that uh, in the overdoped regime, th this shows the fluctuation diagnostic of the self energy. And this shows how the different frequencies of the screened interaction uh, contribute to the self energy. And you see that many different frequencies contribute in the overdoped regime. And then, as you go to underdoping, indeed, you have a classical regime where only the, the smallest uh, component, the smallest frequency contributes. And this is the DCA, this is a different method. It also sees um, this effect. And uh, in our theory, uh, we suppose this is due to the local moment formation. So, um, so these are the key two points that I wanted to make about the difference between weak and strong coupling. In particular, there's a different momentum structure between them. So the weak coupling pseudo gap opens at the hotspots and the strong coupling pseudo gap outside of the antiferromagnetic Brion zone. And there's a difference in the correlation length. We can explain the formation of the strong coupling pseudo gap through a complex vertex correction, where in particular the imaginary part facilitates the truncation of Fermi arcs at the antiferromagnetic zone boundary. And um, uh, the classical regime of spin fluctuations is in our theory explained through the local moment formation. So these are uh, our publications regarding this topic. And this is our publication that was now finally accepted. 
and uh, which was also extensively commented on by Andre Marie. So thanks again for that, and thanks for your attention. Thank you for the uh, seminar. Uh, questions? Hello. Thanks for the great presentation. I have a, a question on the so the vertex correction and so the because for the pseudo gap there was always the story of um, Van Hoff singularity at the antinode. So does that uh, uh, is the Van Hoff singularity at the end making something in the vertex correction, like a special feature? Or? Yeah, so the Van Hoff singularity, um, uh, I mean, first of all, you find it only in, in the particular filling, yeah, but the, the Van Hoff singularity, when you have a short correlation length, I made this point uh, somewhere in the beginning, um, so, Van Hover singularity means or, or so proximity to Van Hover singularity that simply these this endpoints of the Fermi surface are quite close to each other at the at the edge of the Brillouin zone. Yeah, so somewhat close to the to the Van Hover singularity. But since we have um, a short correlation length, which means we have this this sketch this uh, this power magnet scatterings occur with an area given by by such a circle, which is very large. Yeah, so this means in particular close to Van Hover singularity. You cannot differentiate with the weak coupling mechanism between the antinodal point, blah, this here, yeah, at the edge of the Brion zone, and between the hotspot. They are almost identical. Yeah, the, 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 um, the spectrum of the Fermis doesn't change much as a, as a function of momentum. Yeah? So, mm, and this means uh, with a Van Hover singularity alone, it's hard to explain this, yeah? because somehow due to the short correlation length, you cannot aim so well. What our mechanism here shows instead is um, so even, even when you have a small correlation length, so you have to draw large circles, this mechanism can still aim very precisely at points inside of the of the antiferromagnetic brions on those out, those outside. Yeah, you see, because because the target states are different. Yeah, so you get outside and of the outside and inside of the Fermi volume, and this means that our mechanism doesn't need a long correlation length. Is um, in particular, so these circles here, so the correlation length can be quite short, and it's, it's the, the circle should simply be small compared to the Brion zone itself. Yeah, so somehow the circuit cannot extend over over the entire Brion zone. Then this effect is lost. Yeah. So then, next question will be about the local moment formation. So, in your calculations, do you what temperature? Uh, what temperature do you do the calculations? Is it zero temperature, or no? It's finite. Uh, no, this is finite. Um, uh, actually, it would be a question whether the same kind of pseudo gap could be obtained at zero temperature. I'm not sure. Maybe this is a finite temperature at the moment. Huh? But this is at, at 0.15 times the hopping. So this is actually a fairly large temperature. Yeah. You don't know the evolution as a function of temperature of this. Uh, Not yet. So no, this method is, I mean, we have to calculate this vertex. It's quite expensive and uh, low temperatures make it very hard. Okay, so maybe I'll ask a non-expert question. So can you again tell me why vertex corrections are important in this electron self-energy? Yeah, so the... Um, so the idea of the weak coupling theory is that, you, that this vertex can be replaced by uh, a real constant of order unity, yeah? But um, uh, that, that seems to be a reasonable assumption at weak coupling, but, but what we show is that the crucial effect comes from the imaginary component. So you're lost when you do that, yeah? So uh, even if you consider all sorts of momentum dependencies that this vertex could have, and I think we are not so important, but we think the key feature is that this is a complex, uh, quantity. Yeah. Okay, and that opens the pseudo gap. That you... Yeah. So in our calculations, without this imaginary component of the of this vertex, the pseudo gap cannot be opened. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you compute the vertex corrections, do you compute them to first order or? Yeah. So this is a parquet approach. Okay. So actually, this means that all of the parquet diagrams are inside of this vertex quotient. So this is a fairly complete diagrammatic method. Okay. 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 Yeah. So we also tried to do this. We wanted to be unbiased, and the initial idea was also to see whether there are other important fluctuations. But we find only spin fluctuations, and they do this because of this imaginary vertex. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A really basic question in the um, screen interaction. Mm -hmm. 
it's just like the the definition of the uh, little w and the big pi i just don't know what are these quantities yeah so this is the w from the gw theory yeah so this is the interaction we normalized by vertex corrections by what sorry by vertex corrections yeah so in the beginning, I think I had this formula. Essentially, the um, the uh, interacting part of the screened interaction is given by the spin susceptibility. Yeah. So this is a, a bare interaction modulated by the spin susceptibility. And then you can see, of course, when the spin fluctuations are very strong, that you get in this channel a very strong effective interaction or screened interaction. Actually, not screened as much enhanced. We call it screened interaction, but it's, it gets huge. Yeah, that's the point. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so let's thank the speaker again for the next talk. Thank you.